what we're what we really want to focus on today I, I mentioned yesterday this issue about lifestyles versus livelihoods and I talked about how it was a false dichotomy if you think about how Americans describe themselves they never say well hi I'm Linwood I'm an economist in my spare time I like to think about my taxes and pay bills they always tell you you know what their recreational interests are and that's how we tend to define ourselves as ocean users as well um, but there are lots of us and there are many more types of recreational users than there are uh, opportunities for recreationists to participate in the policy process and that really is what we want to try to get at in today's panel to do that we're going to be looking at um, three different constituencies I, I often slip and call them sectors because they are sectors in some sense uh, that have played a, an increasingly larger role in public policy making. Um, we're going to start with uh, Margot Pellegrino, who is an extreme paddler and has uh, become someone who's represented the paddling interests of uh, recreational users, something that we certainly didn't talk much about 10 years ago unless we we're talking about surfing. And when I say extreme paddler, I mean someone who sits down in, in the, the vessel um, instead of laying down on top of it. Uh, although I'm sure you do other kinds of paddling too, but really that's the sector that really has exploded, um, especially in mainland North America uh, over the last five to ten years. Um, then we're going to move to slightly bigger craft, <laughs> and uh, we'll have um, Dan Penagro talking to us about sailing and Sailors for the Sea. It's a, a nonprofit organization that tries to represent uh, a growing uh, a growingly, increasingly active um, sector of the boating community. You know, a lot of us boat to get away from the real world, and now we're being drawn back into the real world as we see that it's uh, more and more difficult to anchor in places and to access places, and if you spend any time on inland waterways, it's increasingly difficult just to navigate them because they're filling in. And um, we're going to wrap up with uh, Tom Raftikin, who's been representing anglers for a long time, and anglers really are a cross-cutting group uh, that includes paddlers and boaters and sailors and people who fish from piers and, and shorelines, and they're all ages and, and races and creeds, and I mean, it really is, um, it's an incredibly large constituency that I think is widely uh, misunderstood because there's so many people who participate in this activity um, including me, who do not necessarily participate in uh, our representation in these processes. And so Tom's really going to talk about um, his experiences in doing that. The panel is, uh, was organized by Pete Stoffer of Surfrider and Amanda Mayhew of um, the IFAW, the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Yes, good. Uh, and we don't have our fourth panelist here, Kyle Thierman, who I referred to yesterday uh, because he has been using social media and um, documentaries to try to get across uh, some of the perspectives of his constituency, which is sort of a, a more narrow bite of the surfing community. And so I think we're going to start um, with a, a little film by Kyle. Pete's going to introduce it for us, and then we'll launch right into our panelists. So thank you, Linwood. Uh, like Linwood said, unfortunately, we don't have Kyle Thierman with us. Uh, however, we do have a short minute, uh, four minute film uh, that Kyle was planning to show. And we're still going to show that film. Uh, and I think it would be a nice way to sort of kickstart our discussion. And as you watch this film, sort of two things to think about. Uh, one, what is the message of this film? Obviously, it's trying to influence personal behavior in a way that will uh, benefit the ocean. Uh, and second, who's the audience for this film? Uh, you'll see very quickly it is targeted towards a younger generation, uh, towards youth, and also towards people that surf and skateboard. And, you know, sort of one of the contexts of organizing this whole panel that David Helvarg and I talked about uh, a couple months ago is, you know, we have millions of recreational users, recreational ocean users in this country, and those activities depend on a healthy ecosystem and yet only a fraction of those are engaged in advocating for ocean protection. Um, so things to think about as you enjoy the film. Welcome to 
to Serving for Change. My name is Kyle Tierman. Up until recently, when I'd go skating, I'd bring a plastic bottle of water with me. When I'd come in from surfing and grab a burrito, I'd take it out in a plastic bag. But then something changed. I took an incredible trip to the North Shore of Oahu. The waves are amazing and it's a beautiful place, but I had no idea that the decisions I make at home have an effect on the people of Hawaii. The Hawaiian Islands are almost like a filter out here in the Pacific Ocean for plastic. It's not like where you just throw the bottle in the trash and you never have to think about it again or the plastic bag and you don't think about it again. Here, if you just go to the east side of the island, you'll know exactly where it all goes. Wait a sec. Is he talking about this plastic bag? They're like toxic tumbleweeds. You know, they just blow out. And so even when they go to the landfills, whereas, which is where the majority of plastic goes, they blow out and they go out to sea. And then they swirl in these gyres and they end up like in Hawaii. There is no limit to them in terms of globally how far the damages of plastic reach. The dolphins, the sea turtles, the albatross. Literally millions die because they mistake plastic bags for jellyfish and they swallow it and then they regurgitate it and feed it to their young and the young can't do anything so it kills them. But I recycle my plastic bag, so where does that go? The American Chemistry Council, which is the lobbying arm of the plastics industry, wants you to say, just recycle, just recycle, and we should recycle, but less than 5% of all single-use plastics are ever recycled. I took a trip to Oahu's recycling center. I found out that they just send it halfway around the world for someone else to deal with. The little recycling symbol on the bottom of plastics doesn't indicate that it has been recycled or will be recycled. Reduce, reuse, become before recycling. Recycling is the last option we do. Is there a better alternative than recycling my bottle of water? For a while I thought bottled water was a safer choice and then I learned it's not even there. Bottled water is less regulated than tap water. There's one person in the entire country that's supposed to monitor the whole bottled water industry. They feel toxic to me to touch now, like it's been so long since I've been using them. It's a huge scam. It's, am it's amazing that they got they've gotten away with it. I cruised around Oahu and found out that there are businesses all over going plastic free. I started having my sales girls say, do you need a bag? And half or more of the people say no. And it feels good to walk into a place and be like, I don't need that. I have my own bag. they will be at the hardware store and be like, oh, I forgot to bring a bag. And then they'll be putting it in the plastic bag, and I'm like, no, no, I can't do it, and I gotta put the duct tape here, and like, okay, all this junk over here, and like try to carry it out of the store. And you make a fool of yourself sometimes, but it's, you know, it's whatever, it's, it's a good challenge. Let's take this challenge on. What habits can you change to make your life less plastic? I'm gonna start bringing my own bottle to the skate park, and next time I get a burrito, I'm bringing my own bag. For more simple solutions that have a big impact, type in Surfing for Change next time you're on Facebook. So there's a song I wrote for uh, World Water Day a couple years back about trying to get rid of uh, single-use plastic water bottles. There's really no need to be such a fancy pants. Put down the plastic water bottles, give the kids a chance, cause the next generation is growing. We gotta be knowing that if we're consuming, we gotta be doing what we can do to reduce our waste. And the best thing to do is don't use single-use plastic. That's it. Awesome. Very cool. All right. We're right on. Yeah, man, nice. Okay, Margo. You, you may stay here. Okay. Um, well, would you rather stay there? Oh, I, I don't care. <laughs> okay, you're welcome to. But I guess it's probably easier to work the PowerPoint it's much over there. Yeah. So. I love that video, by the way. Um, I just have to say one little thing before I start on my gig. See, Billy, do you see now when you go on a field trip why I'm not giving you a plastic water bottle? Okay. <laughs> Is this the little thing? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Um, well. 
Whoops. Okay, here we go. Great. You know, um, it is kind of funny um, when we are talking about ocean policy that there really isn't much of a, a loud outcry or voice at all coming from the paddling community, or at least very, very limited. Um, and one of the reasons I think is because paddling in the ocean, generally speaking, doesn't, it's, it's not a frequent occurrence on a grand scale, as much as people paddle on freshwater areas. Now, of course, you can look at the California coast and you see outrigger canoe clubs and all sorts of paddlers out there, um, and as well in, as in Florida and parts of the Gulf, um, but mostly on the Florida Gulf, around the Tampa area. There's not as many ocean paddlers, except also for like the tourism, you know, like environmental paddlers, you know, they have little tours, you go out on a kayak, you go see all the wildlife but nothing where you have a whole huge cohesive group. And you know, I, I was thinking, I was like, why is that? I, I don't know really why, because there, I think, is certainly potential for growth um, in that area. But, whoops, I did that again. Help. <laughs> um, okay. And I'd say one of the reasons that came to mind about why there's not more um, ocean paddlers out there is because Generally speaking, the ocean can be a pretty scary place, um, especially in parts of the coast, especially on the west coast, it's very, very lonely. Not many people are too inclined to go out there and paddle all alone on the ocean when you know anything can happen and at any one moment. Um, and fog and rocks and rough water all come into play. Why we don't have more ocean paddlers. Not to say that we can't develop that, uh, that market, I think it, but. It, um, I think there's a lot of potential, but it's right now the numbers are just not there. Um, so, you know, back here we have, uh, you know, natural, I call them natural barriers to why we don't have paddlers um, in a grand scale, um, the way we have surfers. But there's also then, when you talk about policy, there's a plenty of impacts um, from policy or lack of that are going to impact the ease with which you can actually access the ocean. Um, and in and, and ways that you don't even think about it. Um, the obvious one is coastal development. You know, when you have private homes and all of a sudden you can't get to your favorite beach to put your boat in because now it's private property. Um, algae can also be a barrier. When I was paddling in the Gulf of Mexico back in 2009, um, I paddled into the Crystal River, which is that picture right down there with all the green goopy algae. Now that was something um, I, that I, I couldn't believe it. It's, it's very tough to get into, very tough to get out of. And apparently, this was May when that picture was taken. In July and August, you cannot even get your power boats in and out of there. All of a sudden, your access is, is cut off because of algae growth, because of what has been done on land, because of poor coastal management and too much development and consequently too much runoff creates this absolute insane algae. So you're stuck not getting out because of basically what's happening on land. Um, and then who would have thought that logging would play uh, a, a role in access and limiting access? If you're paddling along the coast of Washington or Oregon where there's logging, especially in Oregon, um, it is well known amongst the folks in the Coast Guard that all of the silt that is washing down, down the mountains and into the rivers and jamming up um, in the inlets, which they call bars. I mean, there's an increasing amount of very rapid sedimentation in the bars so that it becomes extremely death-defying to go in and out. And in fact, the Coast Guard will close the access to those entrances of the bars. In rough areas, I mean, in, in, in certain areas, they will actually, they will close it when it's like four to six and breaking because it's breaking across the, uh, the sandbars that develop from, from the logging. So once again, because of um, what we're doing on the land and because we, our ocean policy, well, lack of it, um, addresses, you know, what we're doing in our coastal areas and consequently now we have limited access because we cannot get in and out of bars. Which is, if you're gonna be paddling on the west coast, I would suggest going in and out of those entrances rather than trying to launch off the beach. So one thing I think that would help in a variety of ways to get the paddlers to, you know, we need to get more paddlers. 
so that we have voice in ocean policy, but also so that we can help solve some problems. Because one thing that I noticed in areas of high density population where you generally have more pollution, if you have more active users, you have people who care about things because they're out there actively using it. So they care about the trash, they're picking it up, they're cleaning it up, and because they, they're out there using it and they love it and they know it and they want to protect it. Whereas if you have areas of high density, of high, very high population, um, you will have, and, and no users, then you will have a resource that's not being used and not being taken care of. Uh, the plastic bottles in this picture here on the right, um, well, that's in Trenton, and no one's paddling there. And uh, it's totally an under, underutilized resource and the people are just, they, they just don't care about it because they don't use it. So one of the keys I think is, and one of the ways to um, fix this is to get more people paddling. And however we have to do that, I think it's definitely, there's definitely room for growth in that area. Um, because this is what can, what we'll have when we do have people caring and people working together on things. Um, this is the Three Sisters Springs. It's in Florida. It's very close to the Crystal River. And when I paddled through there, um, or paddled and got in that area and got to visit this, this very special spring uh, in 2009, it was, it was kind of an embattled place. Like People were worried that they were going to lose this resource. There was a little kayak um, outfitter very nearby that used this place to run tours. And um, they were in a battle to keep this from being developed. So they got together, they worked with other paddlers. So you have businesses, you have paddlers, and you have environmental groups and even homeowners working together. And in the end, this was a huge, huge victory. Uh, they were able to save this. So you know, this is kind of back to ocean policy, you know, why we need to encourage all users to get out there, use it, appreciate it, and then go and show up at places like this so that we can, of course, add our voice to any kind of policy recommendations. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and hold questions and go straight on to the next one because I have a lot of questions for the panel afterwards. So next up is going to be Dan um, Pindaro. Pindaro. <laughs> I was practicing that too. Would you like to come up sure. here? Okay. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Dan Pangaro with Sailors for the Sea, and uh, that was a great video we just saw. It really made me want to go surfing and uh, sailing and skateboarding and everything, mm -hmm. and fabulous presentation. It's great to look out and see so many faces and people that uh, we all recognize, and sometimes you feel you know people, but you only met them by email, and it's great to actually be here and engaging and speaking with folks. Um, Sailors for the Sea is a relatively new organization. We engage and empower the sailing community to uh, protect the ocean, and it, the Sailors for the Sea was developed as a direct result of uh, David Rockefeller Jr.'s um, work on the Pew Oceans Commission a few years back. And he looked around and thought, what could he do in a community that was completely untapped as a constituency? The, the sailing community has never really come together around ocean conservation or the environment in any meaningful way as an organization. And so a few years ago, he founded the organization. Just four years ago, we essentially had no programs. We had less than a few people participating. This last summer, we had over uh, 35,000 people participate in our program, so we're looking for doubling that this summer. We really see um, a need in the sailing community, and uh, people are responding to it uh, in much the same way I think that when Surfrider initially came out, people said, wow, I can really do this, I can engage, and it's an activity I enjoy doing and can make a difference. Um, it may sound a little uh, interesting right off the bat, but it, it really is a very diverse community. Uh, you have people that live aboard. You have people with a very heavy carbon footprint that might fly by helicopter to their boat. Um, you also have the broad spectrum of, of politics and policy. And it is really um, an interesting challenge for us as a new organization to try to reach out and address not only the individuals, but the different organizations that are involved in the sailing and boating world and how we uh, have a meaningful, coherent response to that. And, uh, it's something we work with, find to be a very big challenge on a daily basis. Um, 
one thing I do know is that the sailing community itself can have a really strong, meaningful impact locally. And I just was made aware by a few folks here in the audience uh, last week about some very interesting economic numbers. That over half, in Massachusetts alone, they have 150,000 plus boaters just in that state. And from May to October, those boaters spent over $500 million. And that economic impact, if it's channeled in a positive direction, can have such great effect locally on your local waters. And one of the things we do at Sailors for the Sea is reach out to those people, those individuals, those organizations, sailing centers, um, community groups that are on the waterfront, like Courageous Sailing Center in, in Massachusetts, or whether it is uh, yacht clubs around the country, and help them implement programs that can make a difference on their waters. Everything from our Clean Regatta program, where we had tens of thousands of people make a difference, as you saw in the video, we've really worked with a lot of people to, uh, and organizations to not uh, use plastic water bottles. It's been a really tough challenge within that organization and that group uh, in general. But we're making a lot of headway and we're able to finally start seeing metrics now after a couple of years and we know that it's tens of thousands of water bottles are being diverted and not used at all anymore. So it, there is some positive impact. Our rainy day kits, thanks to folks um, at University of Miami, I see someone here. Scripps, New England Aquarium. These are educational lesson plans for children, and it's been such a, a well-received program. We just started it two months ago after a year of work, and all of we've we've seen community groups from uh, lakes in New Hampshire to the Great Lakes to San Diego uh, to Houston uh, and Austin, Texas, have all downloaded these lesson plans so that they can implement it this summer with junior sailors. And um, we also do another program as our. Uh, certified sea friendly program that we're just now kicking off and we're working with the marine industry to do uh, a basically a leads inspired uh, marine trades program to look at everything from feedstock to end use of a sailboat and a powerboat and how to make it more environmentally friendly uh, that's been a really big challenge but i'll tell you uh, the industry as a whole from designers to builders to uh, people who work on boats have really embraced it initially and we'll start having some working groups around creating these standards in the coming year. Um, it's been really uh, interesting because the sailing community is so diverse and we do offer a variety of different programs. One thing we try to do with all of them is give people options to engage because even on a single sailboat on a Saturday afternoon you may have a, a father and their daughter you may also have the head of an industry that you may or may not completely agree with what they do. And you may have someone who is a college student and you may have a retiree all working together for two hours as a crew. So it's really hard but also a, a positive challenge for us to have uh, programs that can allow people to engage at whatever level they want to engage in a positive manner. And it's something that we really strive to do. And thanks to people at Scripps and New England and University of Miami to put these lesson plans together that allow people to uh, engage in a meaningful manner, to have a clean regatta, to start composting at a yacht club, to maybe um, start working with the marine industry to lower the impact of uh, what historically has been a very dirty industry, and I think it can make a positive change. Um, I look forward to the rest of the presentations, and I'd say that uh, our uh, organization as a whole is growing by leaps and bounds, and we've really taken the a cue from Surfrider and others, and we uh, look forward to being that untapped constituency to actually start becoming engaged on a daily and weekly manner, not only on our local waters, but also with policy here in Washington, D.C. So thank you. Okay, and last but not least, we have Tom Raftikin. to talk about angling. Thank you, Linwood. Um, Linwood mentioned that uh, this is a cross-cutting group, and, and I, we'll probably get into that afterwards, but I think um, it may give new meaning to the word cross-cutting. Um, the enhanced role of ocean recreationalists play in ocean and coastal conservation, I, let's see if I can get this to move in the right direction. What I want to try and do is get a little bit of background about who the recreational angler is, and. Um, why it makes incredible sense to be better partners between recreational fishing and, and the mainline conservation community. Um, come into a room like this, and, and, and normally when I talk, 
uh, I, I talked to a group of, of recreational fishermen. They're, they're generally fat old white guys like me. So uh, <laughs> the first thing you do, and, and it doesn't work in this room, is, is you know, you, you bring up a, a young lady with a big fish, and it's like, wow, all right, that's fine. And this is kind of the traditional <laughs> view of, of recreational fishing. But uh, uh, Jenny Armstrong is actually our conservation officer. That is, a, a, you know, as, as calico bass, as kelp bass go, that's a huge kelp bass. And it was immediately released after the catch. Um, this is actually an older photo. Right now, they would be both hands under it and take a little bit better care of the fish while it's uh, uh, in captivity. Um, try to give a, define an, a, an idea of, of where recreational anglers are and, and why it's important to partner up. Um, the charts from uh, a global estimate of benefits of ecosystem-based marine recreation potential impacts and implications for management. So this was done about last year, but it gives you an idea of the segment, and this is globally of, of, of how people recreate in the ocean. And, and uh, the largest segment there is, is recreational fishing. Um, they don't have boating on there and sailing. It, it, it obviously will encompass, encompass uh, a lot of whale watching, some of the diving, and a lot of the fishing. Um, We'll have to look at that, or I guess the study, I have to look at that next time. But you notice that one of the, at least measured globally, and at least this study that looked at all recreational, recreational fishing is, is, is currently the largest user group out there. Expenditures. Now, again, I did the chart, but it's back from the same study. And when you take a look at, and this is percentages of, of $47 billion. Um, this was the, annual um, expenditures of, of recreational users. And um, the vast majority of it was, was spent on, on recreational fishing. So, I mean, there, there is economic clout out there. I'll get into something a little bit later about um, Sport Fish Restoration Act, but, but you know, we had $8 billion in, in 2010 of, of sales, and, and that's right at the manufacturer's level. Um, when you start looking at around the corner at, at uh, figures from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, a recreational anglers spend somewhere between 45 and 125 billion dollars in the United States alone uh, every year, and um, 30 million anglers, are, and that's fresh and salt water. So it's not just simply salt water. But why is why is this important? Um, when you start looking at funding, all right, and we start looking at, at, at you know, who funds conservation in the, in the United States, you know, the, the primary, uh, the front line of this is, is uh, your fish and game commissions, your fish and game and fish and wildlife departments of the different states. Uh, one of the things that you have is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, collects through, um, this is Sport Fish Restoration Act money, but every year, uh, well, in particular last year, uh, this was the amount of, this was tax collected federally, $389 million, all right? Um, it's a big chunk of change. I, I'm going to bring this a little bit down to my home state of California a little bit more, only to try and bring it in perspective, but understand that this runs around the entire United States. Um, 19,447,648 dollars went from the federal government directly to the state of California to our uh, California uh, Resource Department and, and into the Department of Fish and Game. And that 19 million and change went to help manage recreational fisheries, but it also is, is a major portion of what is used to help wildlife and, and, and fisheries in the state of California. And, and that's a pretty good sized chunk of change. Um, I, I threw this in there uh, kind of gratuitously, but, but recreational fishermen in California, on top of the federal picture, um, each year we also throw in 60,302,000. Now, this is California, understand? So when we start talking about large numbers, this is just simply within the state of California. But when you start putting all this stuff together, California recreational anglers put 79,779,000 $776 into our 
California Department of Fish and Game into the resource agency, and this is for the management and, and enforcement of fisheries laws, and, and also for the enhancement. I, I mean, you know, we're big contributors on this. And, and I want to say that this is before the first dollar is peeling out of somebody's pocket into organizations that also are trying to help conservation. So this is, this is ground zero. This, this is uh, up front. Recreational fishermen really are a big portion of, of the funding. Um, getting back to the topic, enhanced role that we play. Well, first of all, money doesn't make us the good guys, all right? We put in a lot of money, but, but the thing is we utilize resources. We hope that we utilize them wisely. Um, and the other thing, and I think if there's one thing I'd like to get across to the folks here, is that recreational anglers aren't necessarily the bad guy. Um, Linwood said cross-cutting group. Uh, you know, we're out there, we're, we're, you know, there, there are over two million anglers in California. Um, I think there's something in the neighborhood of 17 million marine anglers uh, in the United States. So we're talking about very, very large numbers and no one does speak for all of them. Uh, I think it's important that, that there's a conservation voice out there because as you've seen before, we can do an awful lot of good out there. Um, quickly, um, when you look at recreational fishing, uh, if you don't get into simply the consumptive end of it, uh, the take the adventure is probably more important th th than the allocation. Um, and again, echoing a lot of the things this morning, what we're all dealing with is public trust resources. And while recreational fishermen have access to those public trust resources, it's incumbent upon us to treat them wisely. Um, our actions do have an impact on those resources and we need to be good partners. And, and again, I, I think when I say good partners, it's really important that we work closely with the, the conservation community because it's, it's critical to us, but the other thing is we can also be very, very good partners out there to the conservation community at large. And bottom line, it has to be a two-way street. It, 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 you know, we've had, We've gone from, you know, when I look back at, at history of recreational fishing, I look back at where, for, you know, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, and, and we were always considered the top stewards of, of, of resources. And that changed in the 90s and, and 2000, and a lot of it was over um, the early uh, beginnings of marine spatial planning and, and marine protected areas, and, and uh, uh, ended up with a pretty good Donnybrook and that's still going on right now and it's really unfortunate because we have so much in common that it's really important to work together. Um, one of the things that we're doing at, at the Sport Fishing Conservancy and, and Sport Fishing Conservation Alliance is looking at, the, at the, uh, the concept of certified recreational fishing. This comes right out of our mission statement. Understanding with privilege comes responsibility. Okay, you know, if you're out there, you're utilizing resources, you've got to, you have an ob we have an obligation to treat them wisely. Um, some of the other things that come along with that, how do, how do, we, how do we do a better job? And these are things that, you know, again, um, we've spent a lot of time as recreational fishermen and, and the groups that I've done with, work with to uh, help clean up really some pretty destructive industrial fishing gear. And, and there still is some out there, but you know what? Those guys are actually doing a fairly good job right now. Uh, within 200 miles of California, there's still no pelagic long lines. Bottom trawls have been mostly removed from California state waters along with, with uh, gill nets. Still got work to do out there, but you know what? They're doing a pretty good job cleaning up their backyard. And it's really important for, and again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but, but also to my, our own folks, that it's important that we also clean up our own act uh, and minimize impacts on habitat. Hey, we're all looking for a clean, healthy ocean out there. You know, I, I saw those slides that Margot just put up there. I don't want to be fishing there, okay? And there's got to be a better way. And, and, and part of that way is, is recreational anglers taking responsibility. But we need your help on this. And again, two-way street. Um, we bring baggage, but um, there are contributions. We do work on, on, on a number of joint projects, and right now we're working, as, as I said, with Sport Fishing Conservation Alliance. Some of the stuff, hopefully next year we can uh, bring some of it, put it on the slides, you see that. Um, 
we'd like to see you guys also. Uh, can you imagine what would happen if we had another $389 million federally to, to help manage the oceans? And, you know, we do a good job of putting dollars in. We're involved in the process. But, but also, hey, guys, you know, you guys need to open up your wallets. Too. And, and I don't talk we versus you. It, it, it's all of us. Um, why is recreational so important, or recreational fishing so important to the conservation community? Uh, we do have choices. Um, yesterday, uh, Greg McGillivray, we need to get people to fall in love with the ocean, and, and that is so incredibly important. Um, conservation ethic, an ethic of resource use, allocation, protection, especially of the natural environment, okay? Um, that's out of Wikipedia, all right? So, you know, even us old guys use the web now and then. But, um, but the important thing is, is uh, resource use, all right? Whether we're paddling, sailing, it, it's really important to get out there and use resources and, and then again to treat them wildly. Why, why, wildly and wisely. Um, and the alternative is, you know, we have people looking to get out and find different ways to reach different people. And, and you know, the problem, one of the problems we see is, is, is that, um, and they're going to deal with it a little bit later this afternoon, with ocean deficit disorder. And, and one of the things we see is nature deficit disorder. And, and there is more to life than having uh, the TV on, the window open, and watching the Discovery Channel. They are great vehicles, and, and they help tell us a lot. But, but the thing is, when you get out and you get, especially getting kids out there, you get your feet wet. You, you, you get your hands wet. All of a sudden, you recognize that it, it's, you really needed to know something to love it. And, and when you do that, this, this is a way that you really get, you get one to one with nature. And, you know, I'm really proud, you know, the organization, uh, April Wakeman and I are here, you know, we, we work with now, and, and, and the past two organizations, we take kids out fishing. That's a big part of what we do. And, uh, and we work with a guy that, that is just crazy, and he gets about, I mean, three to 4,000 kids a year out fishing. This is actually with a group with um, Fun in the Suburb <coughs> program that, that uh, work with the, the Boys and Girls Club in uh, uh, Santa Barbara and, and Carpinteria, California, took these kids out. And, you know, it was a great program, an award-winning program, but recreational fishermen and, and, and uh, Whitney Weeda was the guy that did it. He rounded up a half a dozen folks every week, and I think for 13 weeks during last summer, took kids out every week, and they'd take them out to the pier or different places. And, but you get people engaged with resources. When you get people engaged with resources, all of a sudden, they own it, all right? When they own it, they're really happy about protecting it. So anyhow, with that, um, I'd like to end the presentation, but again, it's incumbent upon uh, recreational fishermen to do a good job, but what we really need to be good partners on this. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Can you turn the